without further ado, let me introduce Steve. He is our speaker tonight. Steve Aylor is a professor of law as well as a lawyer downtown attorney in immigration law. And he's been practicing for over 35 years, so he knows what he's talking about. And talk about timely topics, I think this is it. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? If you have questions as you go along, just raise your hand and I'll repeat the question so people can understand it. Um, so I want to talk about four things today. Uh, first, what is our current immigration system? Some background so you know where we're coming from. Second, how our system got broken. It was broken before this administration, but it's even more broken now. Uh, third, I want to talk about some success stories of people who've been able to navigate our complicated immigration system and how they got here and what they've achieved since then. And fourth, some solutions. You know, how can we solve this complicated immigration system? There are solutions. And some of the people I want to talk about uh, are from a book that I did several years ago called Green Card Stories. It's a coffee table style book. And we profiled 50 immigrants from around the country and talked about how they came to the United States and the navigation they had to go through to get here legally and what they've achieved after they came to the United States. So if you want to learn more about individual immigrants, um, this is um, a book you might be interested in. There are a couple of people here from Ithaca. The one in the far left, for example, is uh, Quiggy. You'll men I'll mention him. Um, and there's a, this one, Alessio Balada, uh, is also from Ithaca. Yes. But, we started the Green Card Stories book before immigration became controversial. We just wanted to talk about these inspiring stories, because every person has an interesting story, and that includes every immigrant. And we found some themes when we went through the book about how immigrants come to the United States. If you think about it, there are billions of people around the, United, around the world, but many of them don't try to leave their home. Um, and why do these people come to the United States? And we found that there are some things about education, making a better life for themselves, and believing in the American dream. And it's great to see that people still do believe that. So the theme of our book is 50 stories, five continents, one America. But to start with a background about the US immigration system, it is the largest in the world and the most complex. Over 10 million people a year come to the United States. Uh, as what we call non-immigrants or temporary visas. They come as tourists or as students or whatever. And about another million people come to the United States because they want to be here permanently. And they get what we call immigrant visas or green cards. Um, and we also have um, many people who come either illegally or who overstay. Um, and there are about 11 million of those people. So to delve down a little more into that, um, here's sort of an overview of the types of people in the United States who are foreign born. The ones on the far left in red are what we call non-immigrants. They're here temporarily. Um, they may be able to work, they might not be able to work. They may be limited in terms of how long they can stay here. They may be able to bring their family members, they may not be able to. Then, if they want to stay here permanently, uh, they go through the process of Uh, getting what we call a green card colloquially. It's not green anymore, but we still call it a green card. They become permanent residents, and we'll talk about how that process works. And then, three to five years after that, if they want to become naturalized U.S. citizens, they can. So that would be the process of a normal person going through our legal immigration system. But up in the top there, in the gray, are a lot of people who don't have documentation. Maybe they came illegally, or maybe they overstayed. We have about 11 million people like that in the United States. And some of them have some kind of quasi-status, like DACA, or temporary protected status, and we'll talk about that. Under the temporary visa categories, we have what I call three types of people. Um, people who can work, or come because of temporary work, some people who are not allowed to work, and some people, like special cases like students, who come primarily to study, but who may also be able to work. And you see all these letters and numbers here, that's because of where they are in the immigration statute or law. Uh, and we immigration lawyers try to remember these categories by associating the letters 
with the people. So A stands for ambassadors, et cetera. I for media. Um, the one I like the best, this goes all the way to V. Uh, I don't have them all listed here. Okay. Uh, the one I like the best is the S category, which I call the sneaky snitches. Because uh, you can actually get a visa to come to the United States if you're coming to testify against, you know, a gang lord or whatever. So, so, uh, so. There are a lot of these categories. Some can come for a long period of time. Some can only come for a short period of time. Tourists, for example, may be able to come only for, you know, say six months at a time. And then if you want to be here permanently, to immigrate, as we call it, there are basically four different ways you can do that. There's the family sponsorship route, where you have a family member, like a U.S. citizen spouse or another green card holder sponsoring you. And we have four categories in that. We call that FS, for family sponsored one through four. Then we have employment-based. We have five categories of those, people who are coming specifically because they want to work permanently in the United States. We have the humanitarian pool, people who come either as refugees or seeking asylum. And then down at the bottom, we have something called the diversity lottery. Uh, Congress, in its infinite wisdom in 1990, set up this way because they said not everyone who wants to come to the United States has a family member or an employer who can sponsor them. So we'll basically have a lottery, and 50,000 people a year can apply in that lottery. And I tell people, the chances of your winning a green card through that are actually better than winning the New York State lottery. <laughs> you can do that every year. So you see that overall, we have about a million people a year who immigrate to the United States. Uh, the family sponsored is blue in there. And no, the blue is immediate relatives. Those are people who have US citizen spouses or parents a month to sponsor them. And then red is family sponsored. So between those two, about 65 to 70 percent of all immigrants to the United States come on family relationships, not because they're coming to work. And then we have employment-based, which is the gray <coughs> down here, 140,000 of those. But actually, that 140,000 includes not just the workers, but also their family members. Yeah. So about a third of them are the actual workers, and the rest are the family members that get to get one of the visas as well. Then we've got the asylum and humanitarian one, and we've got diversity. So it varies from year to year, uh, primarily because we do not have a cap on the number of so-called immediate relatives who can come to the United States, because those have the closest connection because they have U.S. citizens uh, sponsoring them. If you get a green card, it's not actually green. It used to be. Um, but it's like your driver's license, it's very counterfeit resistant, and that allows you to be here permanently in the United States. And then I want to show you some examples of people who got green cards and, uh, from our green card stories book. So Samaya Khalifa, for example, came as the daughter of an immigrant to the United States. She's from Egypt. She settled in Atlanta, and she set up the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta. Uh, and they became very busy right after the terrorist attacks of 2001, educating people about real Islam as opposed to the terrorist images that you see on TV. Um, then we have Cesar Domico. He came to the United States from Colombia. He was a professional magician there, but he got in trouble uh, with both the right-wing paramilitary forces and the left-wing guerrillas because he had offered magic shows for both sides. <laughs> and the other side didn't like that. So he fled to Florida, and he applied for a political asylum, and he won it, and now he works in uh, Florida as a magician. That's a picture of him there. Um, then Hulda Magna Dotar is someone who got a green card based on employment. And she is a neurosurgeon from Iceland, and she came to the United States, and uh, she now works as a neurosurgeon at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. So once you get a green card, you can stay in that status the rest of your life if you want. Um, but if you want to become a naturalized U.S. citizen so that you can vote, then you usually have to wait three to four years to be able to do that. Um, so it takes a long time from the time that you first come to the United States temporarily until you end up as a naturalized U.S. citizen. And I once had a client who took him 22 years from the time he first came to Cornell as a student until he was able to naturalize as a U.S. citizen. So patience is not just a virtue uh, when it comes to immigration, but in the immigration system it's a necessity because of our backlogs. <coughs> Here are some examples. Yeah, I'm going to go through the quotes. And so some, some people just can't get in that easily. 
No, they cannot. Get, and that's one, one of the myths that people think. One, one person, I know one person came for 18 years to get to this country. Right. That's so, and I'll talk about the backlogs in a minute. So here's some examples of people who got green cards and how they got them. Uh, Tutan Lama is a Tibetan. We have a lot of Tibetans in Ithaca because of Snow Lion Press is settled here. We have a monastery. But he settled down in Minnesota, but he got it in, into the United States because he was a Tibetan and he was being persecuted where he's living in India. He teaches uh, Buddhism classes to people in Minnesota. Um, and he's fairly old and elderly and sick. And he very much wanted to become a naturalized U.S. citizen before he died because they believe in reincarnation and he wanted to be reincarnated as a U.S. citizen. Um, and he was able to do that. Reincarnation. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, so we started talking about backlogs. Um, and one of the problems with the immigration system is that Congress has set limits or caps or quotas on the various categories of green cards. And so we're talking about the family-sponsored green cards here. F1 is for adult uh, sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. F2, A and B is for green card holders who want to sponsor either their spouses or their children. Um, and F4, for example, is for brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. And each of these categories has what we call a worldwide cap or quota. Um, and in addition, we also have per country quotas, because we don't want too many people from any one country coming to the United States. So for example, for the brother and sister category, F4 for brothers and sisters, we have 65,000 green cards in that category that we can hand out each year. But more and more people are applying in that category. Right now, we have about 1.3 million people waiting in that category alone. So if you're from most countries, uh, your backlog is December of 2004 right now, which means you have a 14 wait, 14 year wait. So if I had a brother or sister in Canada and I started this process for them, they're going to have to wait at least 14 years because these are the people who are getting in now starting 14 years ago. And the backlog is getting worse, so it's probably more like 20 years. But it gets even worse. If I have a brother or sister from the Philippines and I want to sponsor them, Right now, the backlog is 23 years. <coughs> so by then. so I, I would be dead by then. Is all of that what's referred to as chain migration? Exactly. And that's one of the myths of chain migration. It's not that easy to bring <laughs> other relatives. It can take a long, long time. So theoretically, yes, you can sponsor these other family members, but you're going to be waiting a long time. That's why they sneak in. If they, ha if they have to, that's right. On the, uh, thought I had one here, employment-based. Employment-based is not as backlog. C means current, meaning there is no backlog in that particular category. <coughs> but you see, for some categories, for example, there is a backlog. For example, the employment-based second category is for people who have advanced degrees. Um, but if you're from India and have an advanced degree, say you graduate with a master's degree or, or physics uh, PhD from Cornell, um, you're going to have to wait nine years right now. Your employer may want you to work for them permanently right now, but the backlog is nine years. Now, they may be able to work temporarily on some kind of temporary work visa during that time, but it's a long backlog. So that's one of the problems with our immigration system are these long backlogs, and that means that more people are trying to come illegally because we don't have enough legal ways for them to come. Here are some examples of people who did get green cards despite the complications. Farah Bala uh, was from India, and she was very interested in theater. She got a scholarship to Sarah Lawrence College. And she majored there, became a critically acclaimed actor, and after she graduated, became a drama therapy instructor. And she works now with inner city children in New York City. Because of her so-called extraordinary ability, she was able to get a green card that way. And this was at a time when there wasn't a big backlog for people from India. So that's a picture of her in Queens with the Manhattan skyline behind her. Uh, David Day is from England. And he and his family came on vacation to the United States one time and fell in love with the idea of moving here. Uh, he went back to England and started searching on the internet and found an employer who was saying, I need a carpenter. I can't find one who is a U.S. citizen. So he uh, advertised and applied and there were no U.S. citizens who were able to do the job. <coughs> because of backlogs, the employer had to wait six years for him to be able to come to the United States. But eventually he was able to immigrate with his family, and it's a picture of him on a construction site that he helped build. 
So now he's living the American dream in Georgia. Um, part of the problem with our immigration system is we don't have one agency dedicated to immigration. If you think about environment, you've got the Environmental Protection Agency. If you think about veterans, you've got the Veterans Administration. But when it comes to immigration, we've got multitude of agencies. So the Department of Homeland Security, for example, there are three immigration agencies just within that one cabinet level agency, and they have competing missions. You have the Border Patrol, which deals with enforcement on the border. You have ICE, or Immigration Customs and Enforcement, that deal with enforcement inside the interior of the United States. And you have U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is sort of the benefits granting part of DHS. They're the ones who approve the petitions to get a temporary visa or a green card. And sometimes their missions collide, and so the head of DHS has to try to figure out which is the one that's going to prevail. Then you also have the Department of State. Uh, all of its consular offices around the, country, around the world issue visas to people, so they vet people to determine whether they can get a temporary visa or a permanent visa. You also have the Department of Labor involved, because if someone is sponsoring a foreign worker, the Department of Labor has to make sure that that individual is not taking a job away from a U.S. worker. So it's very complicated to figure out and navigate all of this. As a result of our broken immigration system, um, it gets very hard for employers to find the people that they need. For example, one way that employers can hire professional foreign workers is in a category called the H-1B category. And that allows people to work for employers for up to six years in the United States. They have to have at least a bachelor's degree or equivalent. They have to make sure there aren't U.S. workers who can do that same job. But there are not enough H-1B uh, visas. They're limited to 85,000 a year. That number was set by Congress back in 1990, 29 years ago, and has not changed. Now, you know, a lot more employers say they need people because of an increasingly globalized economy. And so more than 85,000 employers file every year for one of these coveted visas. Last year, 200,000 employers filed petitions. So employers had a one in three chance of actually getting the employer that they wanted to work for them. It's uh, similar in the H-2B area. H-2B is for temporary workers who aren't professionals. So you think about landscapers, construction workers, et cetera, who come temporarily, people who work at resorts in the summertime. We have a limit of 66,000 uh, of those kinds of visas each year, and there's a lottery to try to get one of those visas as well. Um, this year, uh, the Department of Labor, in its infinite wisdom, said that employers could file petitions for H-2B workers on beginning on 12.01 a.m. on January 1st. But then we had the furlough and the computers crashed. So people couldn't even file petitions. It was just incredible. So, um, and so we have this sort of pull and push. On the one hand, employers are saying, we do not have enough workers, so we want people to come in the country. On the other hand, our laws are saying, please do not come into the country, or we'll deport you if you do. If you do. For example, here in upstate New York, over half of all farm workers are foreign workers, and most of them are undocumented. They don't have enough visas for agricultural workers. So it's a real problem if you <coughs> on a dairy farm because you cannot find enough legal workers, but you have to milk those cows at 4 a.m. in the morning. We also have a broken immigration court system. If you do come illegally, or if you overstay, or if you commit some kind of crime, our laws say that we can deport you, but you do get a hearing before an immigration judge, and they are employees of the Department of Justice. We have about 400 immigration judges around the country, and that sounds like a lot, but there are 800,000 cases in the immigration court system. That's over 2,000 cases per judge, and they just can't handle that backlog, and so the backlog gets worse and worse. Right now, on average, someone who's put into the immigration court system has to wait two or three years before they will get to see an immigration judge. So meanwhile, they're staying in the country. Hmm? So meanwhile, they stay in the United States. Yes, but most of the time they're being detained. Um, and so they're being detained at government expense for oh, okay, two or three years to before they get to go before an immigration judge. So we taxpayers are paying for the immigration deten detainees. Yes. Is there a precedent for a lawsuit on cruel and unusual punishment for that kind of delay? 
to get through process? Yeah, the question is, is there a, a, a lawsuit perhaps because they have to wait so long? <coughs> Unfortunately, it would lose because that uh, cruel and unusual punishment is only for criminal cases. Immigration is considered to be a civil violation. Has a lot of bad penalties, like you can't come back to the United States, you might be sent back to a country where you'd be persecuted, but it's been characterized as civil, so the Eighth Amendment does not apply there. Yes? The limitations, how were they calculated? How was what calculated? The limitations on the numbers in the category. Okay. So Congress sets those categories. The last time Congress revised our legal immigration system was in 1990, 29 years ago. And they set the numbers and the caps back then. And they had not adjusted them. So in 1990, the caps worked. You know, we didn't have big backlogs. Uh, but over time, it's gotten worse and worse. So now we've got lots of people who are waiting patiently in line or jumping the queue and coming illegally into the United States. So certainly immigration is controversial. It's complex. People realize we have a broken immigration system. Congress over time has tried to reform it. Uh, the closest they got was in 2013 when the U.S. Senate passed a 1,200 page bill reforming all aspects of our immigration system. It was not a perfect bill, but I think most people would have been able to live with it. Then it went over to the House of Representatives and it died there. And we haven't had a real serious attempt at comprehensive immigration reform since. Um, in 2012, uh, President Obama said, you know, Congress is not reforming our immigration laws. Let's see what I can do administratively. And he came up with this program called DACA. DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals meaning people who arrive when they're children, before the age of 16, and who have been here for at least five years and have not committed any crimes. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to defer any deportation against them. Yes, they're here illegally, but I've got 11 million people in line that I could deport. I do not have enough immigration judges or immigration enforcement officials to go after all 11 million, so let me prioritize them. And at the top of the heap, the people I really want to deport are violent criminals, and we'll go after them. But people like these children who came in through no fault of their own, I'm going to at least let them stay here. Now, they don't have a path to citizenship. They don't have real status. All they have is a promise that they will not be put into deportation, and they get work authorization for two years. And since that program was announced in 2012, uh, 700,000 children have been able to get you know, a temporary reprieve and a work temporary would that, reprieve. Would that include pe uh, people, uh, children who were born uh, from illegal uh, immigrants in the United States? No, if you're born in the United States, you are automatically a U.S. citizen. Even if your parents uh, Even if your parents are here illegal. illegally. It's what we call birthright citizenship. So anyone born on the soil of the United States um, is automatically a U.S. citizen. This is an example from Green Card Stories of someone who isn't DACA because he entered before the DACA program started, but if he did enter after 2012, he would be DACA. Uh, Luis de la Cruz came from Mexico with his family. Then his father was deported. His uh, mother abandoned him. So he and his brother, his younger brother, lived in this little garage here. Um, and they went to high school and they managed to survive. And uh, eventually a local family in Arizona sponsored them for a green card through a particular program for special immigrant children. Um, and he was able to get a green card that way. And now he's attending Arizona State University. And he's becoming a role model. He's in the honors program there. And is an immigrant rights advocate and goes around Arizona talking about the need for immigration reform. So that's our system up through President Trump. Uh, and President Trump has made our very broken system even more broken. He's issued lots of executive orders in lots of different areas, uh, but he's been particularly busy on immigration. These are six immigration-related <coughs> executive orders that he issued just in 2017, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of them. First one dealt with more changes at the border. Uh, this is one of his very first executive orders. He said, I want to have $25 million to build a wall. I want to hire more Border Patrol agents. And I want to uh, be able to immediately deport people who enter the United States illegally without a hearing. So he tried to do that through an executive order. 
The second one dealt with interior enforcement, giving the Immigration and Customs Enforcement people more uh, authority to be able to round up uh, people who are here illegally. He abandoned the priorities that President Obama had said about going after uh, criminal aliens first and saying, now anyone who's here illegally has, is at equal risk of being picked up and put into deportation proceedings. So arrests of non-criminal aliens increased 41% in the first year of the Trump administration. More people are not being actually deported because of this, because of the backlogs at our immigration courts, but more people are being put, picked up and being put into immigration detention. Um, along with that, some cities and states have said, we do not want to cooperate with the administration on rounding up immigrants because we think it hurts our environment. If immigrants feel that it's not safe to report crimes to the local police because they worry that the local police will turn them over to immigration enforcement officials, then let's pass so-called sanctuary resolution to let them feel more comfortable that we're not going to turn them over. That does not mean that the immigration authorities cannot come into Tompkins County or to Ithaca. They certainly can. They have that federal authority. It simply means that if there is someone in the local Tompkins County Jail who is not here legally, the sheriff is not going to call up ICE and tell them, please come down here and pick up this person and put them into immigration proceedings. Uh, more and more localities are doing this now, and it's uh, caused a lot of litigation. But so far, the uh, federal courts have held that it's fine not to cooperate with the immigration authorities. <coughs> Uh, one of the things that you've heard about is that a lot of immigrants are criminals, yeah. um, and that is a myth. Uh, several studies have shown that immigrants actually uh, commit fewer crimes per capita than U.S. citizens. Yes? Backing up to the uh, sanctuary cities, isn't there a constitutional amendment about uh, the federal government cannot force local police to do the federal law enforcement? Yes. Therefore, there's a very legal standard that if they can say we're going to be a sanctuary city and not reporting money. That's yes. constitutional. Yeah, the Tenth right. Amendment that means that all powers not derived to the federal government go to the local government. It's called the anti-commandeering doctrine. Um, and the states and the cities have relied on that. The federal government has, has tried to say, well, if you do not cooperate, we're going to take money away from you. Which is, again, and, a constitutional issue, right? Right. And the federal courts have said, no, federal government, you cannot do that. So, so far, it's, it's like five to zero in favor of the cities and against President Trump in trying to take away federal money from so-called sanctuary jurisdictions. So this is one state's right. Uh, criminal immigrant, um, I already talked about that. Um, and the myth of a border crisis. You certainly hear about that now. But if you look at the raw numbers, back in 1990, 2.1 million people were apprehended crossing the border. Last year it was about 400,000. So over time we actually are uh, fewer people are trying to come into the United States. Now it's true that you know there is an uptick between 2016 and 2017. That's largely because of women and children who are fleeing persecution in Central American countries. Uh, it's not single men trying to find jobs in the United States. Yes. Uh, will you be talking about how um, Congress decides who to give a higher quota to come in, lower quota, uh, going back to the 20s and 1939 when there was a change that Jews were um, downgraded to come in and Eastern Europeans and certain groups of people are not really wanted. Right, in until 1965 country. we had racial discrimination on our immigration system. It was much harder to immigrate from Asia or other countries than it was. So 1965 is part of this general civil rights movement we had a major reform of our immigration laws, and that's when they got rid of these racial quotas and just installed per-country quotas, um, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but now we see problems because of those. Um, so here are some examples of people that managed to come into the United States and get green cards for purposes of our book, but if they were to try to come in today, they would be rounded up and deported. So Cleto Sunday Cesares came in from Mexico when he was a youth illegally. Uh, and he was uh, worked in the fields of Florida for a long time. He was basically a migrant <coughs> farm worker. He went to school when he could. Uh, he became a track star, got a scholarship, 
And he was able to get a green card through the legalization or amnesty program of the 1986 law. And so now he has a green card, and now he's a principal at an at-risk high school in Florida. So he's in a success story. But if he were to enter the United States today, he might be separated from his mother under the family separation policy, and he would be deported almost immediately back to Mexico. Uh, Randolph Seeley is now a orthopedic surgeon in Connecticut. Uh, he came to the United States when he was eight years old with his grandparents. He always assumed that he was here legally. I mean, what kid thinks about immigration? Uh, but he was applying to colleges, and they asked for his Social Security number, and his grandparents sort of had to reveal, well, you don't actually have a Social Security number because you aren't here legally. Um, he was able to get some private scholarship money to go to Duke, um, and he applied. He went in affirmatively to an immigration court back before there were backlogs and say, yes, I'm here illegally, but I want to apply for a special kind of relief called cancellation of removal. Uh, the judge saw that he was in medical school, he had good, you know, he hadn't done anything wrong in terms of committing a crime, his only crime was overstaying, and so he canceled the deportation order and he got a green card and now he's operating in that room in Connecticut there. Wow. Uh, Nellie Boyette, is one of my favorite stories from the Green Card Stories book. She was an undocumented uh, person from Peru. She came to Florida uh, and set up a booth at a uh, flea market. Uh, and that's her husband there. I forget his name, but he ran uh, another booth at a flea market. He went around with a boombox on his shoulder saying, immigrants speak English. Um, but he fell in love with Nellie, um, and they got married. And because he's a U.S. citizen, it should have been simple for her to be able to get her green card. But they weren't so, the immigration agency wasn't so sure that their marriage was legitimate. And it took them four years to convince the immigration agency that their marriage was legitimate, uh, and now they operate a joint booth at the flea market. <laughs> Um, so other things that have happened, uh, employer sanctions. Um, we've had the law since 1986 that if you're an employer and you hire someone who is not authorized to work, you can be fined or even sent to jail. Um, so for example, what's the really big tree cutting service in the United States? You see them all around. I forget, whatever they are, they're the biggest in the United States. They got fined $90 million for knowingly hiring uh, workers for, to cut down trees all around the United States. Uh, employer sanctions have increased under the Trump administration, so employers are much more worried now than they were before about these kinds of sanctions. Um, another thing that's happened is that in addition to President Trump trying to terminate the mm -hmm. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival program, he's also tried to terminate this program called Temporary Protected Status. This was a program set up by Congress in 1990 that says if you come into the United States and then something bad happens in your home country, like civil war or earthquake or volcano, we will not make you go back to your home country until conditions improve. And 300,000 people have received this sort of temporary status. It's not a way to get a green card. It simply means that they don't have to go back until conditions improve. But Trump and his administration have terminated this status for people from El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Sudan, uh, and Haiti, and about 300,000 people are at risk of being sent back to their home country. So if you add that 300,000 from temporary protected status, plus 700,000 from the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals that are under threat, uh, we've got about a million people that could be sent back to, to their home country in the next few months. Back to the employer sanction. Program. Sure. E-Verify is yes. a program. Yes. E-Verify is a program set up by the government as a pilot program, saying that you know we understand that it can be hard for employers to look at a green card to determine whether it's a real green card or some fake green card. So E is for electronic, and Verify means that they can call in or get on the internet to the immigration agency and social security to verify electronically whether a person is authorized to work. But it's a limited system? Or it's a limited it's system. It's, it's still a pilot program. It's not mandatory. And that's one of the things that the Senate bill in 2013 would have done, would be to make it mandatory, to make it easier to, un, to know who really is here, legally or illegally. Well, so, for example... Government contractors, people with government contracts, employers with government contracts, 
have to use E-Verify. Yes, that was set up by an yes. executive order, and that's so those federal contractors have to use right. E-Verify, and some states have passed their own state version of E-Verify, but here in New York State, we don't have that. Uh, but it can be hard to determine whether someone's got a legal green card or not. You may have seen the New York Times story a couple of months ago about uh, the Trump golf course in New Jersey hiring uh, undocumented workers and how basically they would say, go out on the street, buy a green card that looks legit, and then we'll hire you. So, uh, Among other things, the Trump administration has cracked down on refugees. Uh, in the last year of the Obama administration, President Obama was going to let in 110,000 refugees. This year, um, the administration is only going to allow in 30,000 refugees, and it's not even sure if we'll meet that quota. And they imposed a travel ban on lots of different countries. It was ultimately <coughs> upheld by the Supreme Court as legal because presidents have wide discretion when it comes to immigration generally. Here are some examples from the Green Card Stories book of people who did come in as asylum seekers that did make it, but under the current administration would not be able to make it. So Peter Ajak is from Sudan. He's one of the lost boys of Sudan. You may have heard about them. They had to flee the civil war there and go through swamps to get to resettlement camps in Kenya. Uh, ultimately, he came to the United States as a refugee and had legal status. But then he had a problem with the law. He was driving a friend in a car when they were pulled over by the police. And the friend had a gun that he was not authorized to have. And even though Peter didn't have the gun, he was the driver, he still was put into deportation proceedings. Luckily, he had a good lawyer down in Houston, and he was able to resolve it. And now he's on his way to become an immigration lawyer himself. Um, but. Under the first travel ban, people from Sudan were not allowed to come into the United States. And even now, people from Sudan are subject to what was called increased uh, vetting or security background checks. So it's very hard to get even legally from Sudan to the United States. Moktaba Maki is another person from Sudan. He's from northern Sudan. He also fled the civil war there, eventually made it to a refugee camp, and then was resettled in Tampa. Um, and he took a job as a janitor in a warehouse to make ends meet, and now he's studying to be a dentist and trying to earn enough money to be able to bring his family over to the United States. But again, under the first travel ban, he would not have been allowed to come in, even as a refugee, to the United States. Mary Apik uh, from Iran, again, uh, she got in as a refugee right after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. <laughs> Um, and she was an actress, still is an actress, and has performed in one-woman shows at Lincoln Center and Kennedy Center. Um, but it's been a hard road for her because of hostility toward Iranians. And in the first travel ban, Iranians were not allowed to come into the United States. Iraq. Uh, Haider Abduwabab is an amazing story. He was a bodyguard for the U.S. military in Iraq. Um, and he was... Uh, hurt in an explosion. They thought he died. They took him to the morgue. His brother went to identify him in the morgue and realized that when his toe twitched that he wasn't actually dead. They pulled him out of the morgue, uh, but he was blinded. Uh, eventually he made it to the United States and then some surgeons in Florida um, did a surgery to be repair one of his eyes. And so he has to wear sunglasses all the time because it's, he's very sensitive to bright light, but there he's looking at his son who was born in the United States after they came as refugees. So he's a success story. But again, under the tra first travel ban, would not have been able to come to the United States. Um, so I've been talking about asylum, but I haven't really explained what asylum is. Asylum is not just a nice thing that we should do. It's actually an international agreement that the United Nations passed in 1951 in which we incorporated into our own U.S. immigration law. We have an international obligation to not let people who have a well-founded fear of persecution be sent back to their home country. Um, and we roughly between 30 and 50,000 people a year uh, qualify for asylum, um, in addition to the refugees who come to the United States. Um, and it's getting harder and harder to qualify for asylum. The Attorney General Sessions has tried to use the law to interpret it in ways to make it harder to win asylum. And the Trump administration also made it harder by physically separating women and children last June, but it caused such an outcry that at least they stopped that, although it seems like maybe they're subtly starting to do it again. This is a person who got asylum. Uh, he actually he is here in Ithaca. 
Uh, he was a librarian, came to the law school on an exchange visitor visa. I met him in the law school stacks. This was back when Liberia had a civil war and he had been persecuted, so I got asylum for him. Uh, but then it took two years for me to help get the rest of his family over here from Liberia, but they're all resettled now and live down in Fall Creek. Um, Gulnahar Alam is from Bangladesh. Uh, she also got an asylum-based green card based on domestic violence. Her husband abused her. And at the time when she came to the United States, it was very hard to get asylum on that basis. You usually think of persecution based on the government doing something against you. This was by her husband, but she had a good lawyer, and he was able to convince the immigration judge that she qualified for asylum. And now she's a prominent activist helping domestic workers in the New York City area. So I've talked about what Trump has done through executive orders. He also would like to change our legal immigration system, but that would require the cooperation of Congress. So in 2018, about a year ago, he came out with something called the Four Pillars, which is why the slide shows Four Pillars, of how he would change immigration law. Uh, he would end the so-called diversity visa lottery, the way that people can get a green card just based on a lottery. He would also end several family-based green card categories, so brothers and sisters, for example, would no longer be able to immigrate to the United States. Uh, part, the third pillar would be to spend $25 billion to build the wall. And the fourth would be that he would legalize up to 1.8 million undocumented immigrants and the DACA recipients. So that was sort of the sweetener to try to get the Democrats to agree to this proposal. Overall, if that had gotten enacted by Congress, it would have cut legal immigration to the United States by 44 percent. Um, another thing I didn't put on the slide here was he was also in the employment-based system going to start a points-based system uh, where you would get certain points because you knew English or you had a PhD or you're going to work in an area where we really needed you. The New York Times did an analysis of the points-based system and calculated that only about 2% of all Americans would qualify for the points. This proposal didn't go anywhere in Congress at the time. Um, and if you happen to see the President Trump's speech on TV last Saturday, uh, what he's offering now is sort of a watered-down version of this. Yep. So instead of yeah. giving uh, legalization to the DACA recipients, he would only allow them to stay here for three more years. Um, and that seems like it's dead in the waters on Capitol Hill as well. Here are some people who have immigrated to the United States that under these proposals, if they became law, would no longer be able to immigrate. So Charles Niaga is a minister in Atlanta. He was able to immigrate through the diversity green card lottery. Um, but, no actually, yeah, he w did a winner, but the, the, the numbers were all used up, but it turned out his brother also uh, applied for him, so he's able to get that. But under the diversity lottery, he would no longer be able to immigrate. Uh, Lina Thao is a Hmong mm. refugee, uh, and her family came in. Uh, they were chicken farmers in Arkansas, but she really didn't like that, so she went by a mixed martial arts studio one day and took some lessons. Became very good at it, and now she's a professional mi mixed martial arts person. But again, she originally arrived as a refugee, and under the travel ban, she probably would not be able to come to the United States. So, I've talked about all the problems. Now, what are the solutions? How can we fix our broken immigration system? It's not going to be easy. Immigration is one of the most complex systems of law that we have. Some courts have said it's the second most complex area of law after tax law. So if you're all struggling with your taxes right now, just think about immigration. But it can be done. The Senate did something in 2013. And I, to try to boil it down, I say it's the three E's. We need expanded visas so that people can come legally without long backlogs, both temporarily and permanently earned legalization so that people who here are illegally know that eventually they'll be able to stay here and get a green card. Uh, they'll have to pay a penalty for being here illegally. They have to show they have not committed any crimes, but so they'll earn their way to legalization. But then we'd have to get rid of all of these people who are living in the shadows of the law and undercutting wages for U.S. workers. And the third E is enforcement. We do need to enforce our borders to try to make sure that people come in legally, not illegally. Um, the Senate bill was not perfect, but it did sort of go along those lines there. Um, but legislation is uh, very hard. There's a lot of compromises. Otto von Bismarck 
famous politician from Germany, once said, there are two things you should never see being made, sausage and legislation. <laughs> and that's certainly true for immigration legislation. There are going to be a lot of hard compromises, and anything that Congress passes is not going to be perfect, but we still at least have to try. Um, there are a lot of economic benefits to immigration. If you think, for example, just about international students. International students bring $39 billion a year to the United States, not just from their tuition, but you know, living, working, buying cars, setting up bank accounts, etc. And they create directly or indirectly 455,000 jobs for U.S. workers. Um, so they are a big uh, aspect of immigration. Um, studies have shown that at a macro level, a national level, immigration is a net economic benefit to the United States. It helps the United States stay innovative, compete in the global economy, and by bringing in new talent to the United States allows us to grow economically. Um, and it's true for both authorized and unauthorized workers. So, for example, in the dairy industry in upstate New York, we would not have a dairy industry here if we did not have foreign farm workers. We do need to legalize them so that they don't fear going to the grocery store and getting picked up and turned over to immigration authorities. But they are an invaluable person, uh, service to us, because I know my son is never going to get up at 4 in the morning to milk cows. <laughs> um, public perceptions, you know, if you take the Gallup public poll every year says that more people favor immigration than uh, think that we should have fewer immigration, but you wouldn't know that from this administration. Um, but because of this administration and because of our general broken immigration system, we're having some problems. Tourist visas are down about 9% because people don't feel comfortable coming to the United States. International student decline is a decline of 6.6% in the most recent year, the first decline in several years. So that's hurting us economically. Um, adverse economic impact. So <clears throat> the last bullet point says that even though President Trump has not been able to build his visible wall on the U.S.-Mexico border, he's effectively already built an invisible wall to make it harder for people to immigrate legally to the United States. What you can do personally, there's a lot that you can do. Um, you can write your members of Congress telling them they need to pass comprehensive immigration reform. You can contribute to immigrants' rights organizations. There are a lot of organizations here in Ithaca that you can work with. For example, there's Ithaca Welcomes Refugees uh, that helps refugees that resettle in the United States. There's the Tonkin Literacy Partners that helps people learn English. And a lot of refugees and other immigrants go through that. Um, you can also follow national immigration organizations, such as the ones listed on the slide here. So the more that you know, the more that you can dispel the myths and talk about the true facts, the better educated everyone will be, and we can have a serious, you know, meaningful, rational debate about immigration. So with that, I will stop. I want to thank everyone uh, for inviting me to speak, and before I turn it over to questions, um, if you want to get more information specifically about immigrant farm workers, there's going to be a follow-up meeting on Monday, February 11th at the Interfaith Center for Action and Healing here in Lansing. Mary Jo Dudley, who's the director of the Cornell in Immigrant Farm Worker Program, will be talking about particular immigration problems of farm workers in upstate New York. So. Is there a difference between visitors and tourists? And how big is the tourism? Yeah, so the, one of the categories is for tourists. Those are called B2, because that's where they are in the immigration statute. And we get about 9 to 10 million people a year coming in as tourists. And they're also visitors. They're not allowed to work, but they can come in to visit family or go to Disney World or whatever. But as I mentioned in a previous slide, that is down about 9% uh, over the last year because fewer people want to come to the United States because they worry about you know, what's going to happen to them or whether they're going to be able to get in through the border. What's the difference between jail and immigrant detention? It's not really a difference. That's just a sort of a euphemism for jail. Uh, there are federal facilities that are jails uh, that are also housing immigrants, and sometimes they're housed side by side with real criminals and people who have committed immigration civil violations. In some places, we don't have federal facilities, and so they'll be like in local jails, because local jails have extra space. We also have for-profit companies that build jails um, specifically to house detainees because they make a profit off of that. And in fact, they have very good lobbyists in Congress, and they have persuaded Congress that we have to detain at least 44,000 immigrants every night. Even though we do not need 44,000 beds, uh, the 
Congress has told the immigration authorities that you have to fill up at least 44,000 people uh, who are immigrants every night. Yeah. So, at taxpayer expense. Uh, I know that um, that the crime is not is not crime uh, more crime done by the foreigners, but you know we don't see any figures of this. You know, President Trump says, "Oh, they're killing people. You know, they're killing people." We don't see any hard figures. Why is that? You, you don't, don't see any hard figures by President Trump or people oh, budding. Either, either way, we don't see we don't see any, anything that, that says that Trump is right. And we don't see anything that says that. Well, for the Cato, I mean, I've got <laughs> I've got statistics in my talking notes here. About the Cato Institute has come out and said that immigrants are X percent less likely to commit crimes than U.S. citizens based yeah. on. But you know, it's not. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's not in the papers. It's not. Publicized. It's not, not publicized. publicized. Right. And you know, I just think that you know that many people they you don't see you don't see figures, figures publicized so people can think what they want, you know. And um, well, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying also, um, I know that there's there's a, a a a big problem in Europe because they're getting thousands and thousands of people coming in and. Some people are afraid that that could happen here in the United States. What is the difference between the immigration in Europe and, of course, we have so many, so many blockages so that people can't come in like they do in Germany? Well, it's similar. I mean, people worry about immigrants. People like individual immigrants who live next to them. They know them, but they worry about immigrants with a capital I, thinking that they're going to overrun the country, and so we're facing similar problems in the United States and elsewhere. But it's a, more of a philosophical question. So let me take the question back there next. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I have two questions. The first one is: you talked about a number of categories, and there are numbers attached to how many people fall into those categories. Mm -hmm. That question has uh, what I what I want to know about that is: how do they determine those numbers? And the second question I have is: I recall that there have been quotas for different countries over history, yes. and that they have gone up and down, and, and I want to know why. Um, part of it in the early days was purely racial discrimination. You know, yeah. we, didn't want, we didn't like Germans or Italians, so we had a very low quota for them. Then I we thought. didn't like the Asians, so we had a very low yeah. quota for them. Yeah. And in 1965, we got rid of those sort of, you know, very explicit discrimination basically just had per country caps. So now no country can have more than 7% of any one uh, particular category. Uh, and so for small countries like Monaco or you know, other, you know, <coughs> Paraguay, you're not going to use up their 7%. But big countries like China or India, the Philippines, Mexico, they use up their quotas. That's why their backlogs are worse than uh, people from other countries. Um, in terms of how they set the numbers, there's no real rational reason as to why they give 65,000 to brothers and sisters and 110,000 to spouses and green cards. They pull these numbers out of thin air. And, you know, at the time, maybe they looked at statistics about how many people actually came in the prior year and they thought, well, that would be enough. But since we have not modified our immigration laws in 29 years, those quotas have come horribly skewed. So, yes. You talked a little bit about H-1B visas and high-skilled labor visas. Is there a visa for either a low-skilled or a no-skilled worker? I ask just because, say you are working for a winery and you're not documented. It would seem to me the government would want you to have at least a Social Security number so you could pay Social Security taxes and FICA and Medicaid tax. I mean, those are all the taxes the government's kind of missing out on with these with these lower skilled workers. So is there a visa like that? Not exactly. The H-2B comes closest, because um, that's for non-professionals, but it has to be seasonal work. Um, so for example, dairy workers are not considered H-2B eligible because you work in dairy all year round. By contrast, you know, we also have H-2A workers if you work in agriculture. Um, but those are also limited. But you do have people like from Jamaica who come they pick sugar cane in Florida in February, they go up to pick the onions in Georgia in March, eventually they make it up to New York State and pick apples in the fall, then they go back to Jamaica for a couple of months and they start the whole routine again. But we don't have sort of a permanent uh, temporary worker category because it's, you don't want permanency in temporary work, you want them to get green cards. Now theoretically, a winemaker could hire someone 
permanently in the, what we call the EB3 category. But that's limited to 50,000 visas a year, and that's backlogged. And you also have to go through a long labor certification test to make sure there are no U.S. workers who could do that same job. So, up here. So, if legislation were to be passed in some kind of compromise with each other, blah, 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 to, in, to provide funds to increase the needed personnel without changing the laws, would that make things worse? You mean to train U.S. workers to do the jobs? No. The, 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 the border people. We don't have enough people at the borders. Okay. There's a pressure to... Uh, to add money to give, and that seems reasonable. Right. But is it if you don't change the rules? Because won't you be reinforcing the bad laws? Well, part of it is what trying to prevent think? people from coming into the United States, and, mm -hmm. and part of that's, you know, literally impossible because if someone's fleeing persecution, you know, it's, they're not going to care how many Border Patrol agents are there at the border, they're still going to try to come in. It may have a deterrent effect on people who are simply coming here to try to make a better life or to find a job. So Border Patrol is never going to be a 100% solution to stopping illegal immigration, but you can do a better job. And it may not be physically more people on the border, it may be sensors, it may be other electronic ways to make sure that people don't enter. Ultimately, you know, if we had more foreign aid for Central American countries so that the economies of those countries were better, people wouldn't feel the need to leave those countries. So part of it is a push and a pull. Sometimes people come because they're pushed out because they don't have a job, uh, or they're pulled because there's an employer who's, who says, I can hire you. And sometimes they're pushed from their country because of persecution or other bad conditions. So, over here. Would you also add to what you just said, the political um, environment in Central America? We have supported, like, Samosa, in Nicaragua and, and many dictatorships so we have put in people and as a result it's it's not possible to to live there. Okay, now we can say Ortega has you know, he's doing really really awful things um, in Nicaragua and big people are leaving there and they're going to Costa Rica. But wouldn't if we had would support different governments, wouldn't that, you know, um, lessen the amount of people, or totally de deter people from coming because they could have a life, and, and that sure. goes along with the Sure, if we had democracies economics. in those countries, yeah. they, feel they had an opportunity to uh, do well in their own country. But even in countries with certain democracies, like Mexico, it's not a great country, but it's more democratic. You know, a lot of people still fleeing Mexico because of the gangs there, narco-terrorism, etc. So it's partly, partly foreign relations, we need to do a better job there. It's partly more economic aid, so people feel comfortable staying in our countries, and it's partly enforcing our borders. Yes? You had a slide about the executive actions or executive orders. Can you just give a quick rundown where those stand? There's like seven of them or something? Sure. So we had three of those executive actions dealt with the travel bans. The first two of those were struck down by the court. The third one was upheld um, by the Supreme Court in June of 2018. You had two executive actions relating to enforcement, uh, border enforcement and interior enforcement. Those have not been challenged because they basically just say, do more or change your priorities within the existing parameters. Um, then you had one uh, from April of 2017 called Buy American, Hire American, which instructed the agencies to say, <clears throat> you should do a better job of trying to find U.S. workers rather than foreign workers. Again, that's not been challenged in the courts directly because it simply says enforce the laws more vigorously. So that one was more of a public relations stuff than anything else. Other questions? A couple of things on um, visas, tourist visas. If, 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 does every non-citizen coming here for a two-week vacation have to get a visa or do some countries come just on the basis of a passport? Correct. Uh, it's the latter. We have uh, what we call the visa waiver program. If we have good relations with a country and that country has less than a 2% overstay rate, then we'll say you don't need to actually get a visa stamped in your passport. You still have to register with CBP, Customs and Border Protection, ahead of time to get on the plane. So that that way that you have committed some crime or something, they can flag it and they'll either stop you from getting on the plane or they'll stop when you get here. But if you're from a country like most of the European countries, 
and you wanted to just come to go to Disney World for two weeks, you don't actually need a visa in your passport. But if you wanted to come, uh, say, and that's only for tourist visas, if you want to come right. to study at Cornell or get a work visa to work in the United States, you would have to get a physical visa. On your so passport. the second part, the uh, employment visa that you get for six months or whatever, overstaying that is one source of violation. Yeah, 62 percent of all people here illegally are actually overstays. Not coming across the board. Not, they come across. They come across legally, but they overstay, and that's 62 percent of the 11 million. Uh, it's actually my, you know, that's the majority. So. And I understand. Which makes sense. We lived in Boston a long time, and as I understand, the 50,000 Irish, Irish people oh. illegally here. Right. Nobody's complaining about. That's right. That's right. That diversity lottery program that I talked about enacted in 1990, that was Senator Kennedy trying to make it easier for the Irish to be able to. They get vetted though, the diversity lottery is vetted as strongly as any other. Anyone who wants any kind of green card simply because you have a family member or whatever doesn't mean you automatically get the green card. We have 37 grounds of inadmissibility and 20-some grounds of deportability. So if you are a bigamist or you committed a crime or we think you're a terrorist or you cannot support yourself in the United States, even though you qualify for a category, we're not going to give you a visa. Everybody goes through a double-check system. You first get vetted by the State Department <coughs> with a visa and your passport, and then you come to JFK or wherever, and then you get vetted again by Customs and Border Protection. Uh, so we've got a very robust system. For refugees, for example, on average, it takes a Syrian refugee 22 to 24 months after they've been selected for, as a refugee to go through the security background screen. This was under the Obama administration. The Trump administration has not changed that whatsoever, other than to claim it's not stringent enough. But the old system is 22 to 24 months, and they had to go through 21 different steps with State Department, Department of Homeland Security, OIR, which is the Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, before they would actually be admitted to the United States. What, what sort of treat a, a refugee and an asylum seeker? That's a good question. I should have mentioned that. A refugee is someone overseas who has a well-founded fear of persecution. And we say we want to take 30,000 refugees this year, so we delegate the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for identifying those refugees and doing a background check, and then we'll accept them into the United States as refugees. An asylum seeker, by contrast, is already in the United States. Maybe they're a Cornell student, and you know, civil war breaks out in their home country, and they don't want to go back. Um, then they apply for asylum in the United States. So the legal test is the same, well-founded fear of persecution. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're overseas, you're called a refugee. If you're already here, you're called an asylum seeker. An asylum seeker could be standing on the bridge crossing the river of Grant. Right. But they have to get in. They have to be they across have the line. They have to cross the line. Once they cross the line, then they can apply for asylum. Which is right. the, um, was there a time when the United States did not have the immigration controls of this type except to keep out criminals, et cetera? Yeah, and 1890s when we first had our first immigration laws of setting forth, you know, we don't want certain kinds of people, we don't want anarchists, terrorists, etc. So we didn't really have, because up until that point in time, we wanted people to settle the United States. So we accepted most everybody who was coming on any kind of boat. We said, come on, come on in. We don't care where you're from or what your background is. So when people say, well, in the old days, you know, they all went through legally, well, there wasn't really a legal system they had to go through, and there was no backlog. <laughs> Yeah. Some, um, some people That's make an argument going on in Canada. They want people. this is what we perhaps should go to at this point. What are the pros and cons of doing that? If we did not have any legal system at all? If we, only, <laughs> if we used the system to keep out uh, people we know who are criminals or other ne'er-do-well, but did not have another uh, other oh, categories, etc. Well, I think that... The I think we'd have basically you know, open borders. Everybody would want to come to the United States. I mean, uh, it's amazing to me. People still want to come to the United States. Even more people would come. And I think we'd have much more of a feeling that we're being overrun by immigrants. Every country has to control immigration in some yeah. way. So you say it has a definite, terrible downside to it? Yes, open borders would have a definite downside to it. I don't think the American public would stand for it for more than a year.
<laughs> you mentioned the international student population was down. Is that at Cornell? No. The top tier universities, the Ivy Leagues, their yeah. uh, international student application pool is as strong as ever. Because yeah. okay. people still feel, well, an Ivy League education, I'll be able to and, get a job. Okay. It's more your second and third tier, your central Missouri state, or your, okay. you know, those kinds of institutions that have been relying mm -hmm. on international students, because international students tend to pay top dollar, you know, they're not getting yes. financial aid. So they really help the those second and third tier universities to stay afloat. I just yeah, read a statistic, I think it was Central Missouri State or whatever, had to lay off 200 people um, because, you know, they did not have nearly as many international students as they used to have. Well, that brings me to the second part, then. What about faculty, uh, staff, international? Uh, are those numbers high as well? The number of international staff and faculty? Someone coming to Cornell to teach German Physics or, or history or whatever. Right. Those, those people are still getting through. We have a category for what's called extraordinary ability and outstanding professors okay. and researchers. Um, and, you know, if you're coming to Cornell, you're outstanding. Yeah. So they're not having problems. But, you know, if I were a faculty member and I'm trying to apply to teach at Central Missouri State, I don't mean to denigrate Central Missouri State. But, um, I don't even sure it's a university. But, you know, they're having problems recruiting faculty because are they, are they extraordinary, outstanding if they're teaching, you know, in the middle of Missouri? I don't know. Yes. I have two questions about Canada. Um, don't they have a point system? And uh, does that work? And do they keep a lot of people out with that? And uh, second, we have an awfully long border with Canada. Aren't there problems with people? Don't we need a wall there? Uh, yes, we have problems. Just, we do have people come in illegally, but not to the same extent as from Mexico and Central America. So a lot of these changes that you've seen are only applying at, on the southern border. Uh, we're not building a wall on the northern border. Um, but Canada does have a point system. One of the problems I see in our system is that Congress is the one who's making all these changes, and Congress doesn't like to make changes. In Canada and Australia and other systems, they give much more authority to their immigration ministries. So if the ministry says, you know, we have too many nurses this year, they'll say, no more nurses this year, but maybe next year. Uh, the, the point system gives you more flexibility, because you can say, you know, we want maybe 100,000 people coming into Canada, so you know, we'll make the point system here. And if it turns out it's too many, then they'll drop the points the next year. They don't have to go back to Parliament to get permission to change it. And that kind of flexibility, I think, is important because conditions change. You've got a recession one year, a booming economy the next. But we're locked into this legislative solution. And since Congress can't change immigration very often, we're sort of out of sync all the time. But I don't think Congress is willing to give up its power to let the immigration agency sort of tinker with it. Yeah. Over here. If we are to believe the climate scientists, then many countries near the equator in the next 50 to 100 years are going to become uninhabitable. In which case, you're going to be seeing hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of people will be becoming refugees, I guess. Well, not in a legal sense, but they are refugees in a real sense. They'll be des desperate. They'll right, be desperate. And what do you think is going to happen? Well, I think. You know, immigration, migration generally is one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Not only because of that, but because of more civil wars around the country. More people are migrating or having forced to leave their own countries to go to another country than any time in our history. Uh, and so it's going to be a real challenge. It's not just the United States that's facing this issue. As you pointed yeah. out, Europe yeah. is facing this issue. Australia is facing this issue, even though it's an island country with people trying to escape to get to uh, Australia. So it is a real problem. On terms of climate refugees, unfortunately, under the UN 1951 convention, nobody thought about climate change back then. So they're not technically refugees, so they don't get that kind of protection. But it is a real problem, and people are going to be fleeing, and the question is what country is going to be dealing with them, whether it's a neighboring country in Africa, or the Middle East, or India, or wherever. So it is a big problem. Yes. You mentioned Congress. Have you and Tom Reed ever had a serious discussion about immigration? No. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to? Yes. Not that I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, here and then over there. Okay. Um, you said that you're giving talks explaining um, the hype that Trump 
I mean, even Obama deported many, many, many people. What would you say, and you know, but the people that need to be spoken with, they're not going to come to your talks. So what would you say to people that are rural, very poor, have no job skills, and are exceedingly threatened by the people that they consider, that are immigrants or undocumented immigrants, that are taking their jobs and they are just very convinced of this. So how would you speak to an audience that's not That's a very good question. I don't have a great answer for that, but I will talk about somebody named Ali Narani who runs the National Immigration Forum out of Washington, D.C. Um, and that's an immigrant rights organization, and you should follow their newsletters. They're very good. And he has struggled with this question as well. And he said, he came to the conclusion that, you know, if I go out to Iowa and I try to talk to people, they're not going to listen to me because I'm from Washington. I'm inside the Beltway. But if I talk to the sheriff in that town, and I convince the sheriff why it's in his own interest not to enforce immigration laws and deport people, uh, or I talk to a, you know, a minister in that town, those people have credibility yes. with those people. And by then talking about it in their sermons, or having the sheriff write an op-ed in the local newspaper, they may have more ability to persuade people about the benefits of immigration than I coming in from Washington, D.C. to do. So, for better, for, you know, I think that's a decent solution. Can you spell his name? And also, I would add that sitting down and having discussion on, on really just about any issue that's very hot from a moral perspective rather than from a political perspective brings a person's heart. And this way people are much less threatened because you're talking in a different forum as opposed to the political. And I, I agree with you, you've got to bring people from the community to do the facilitation. Right, it's what he calls third-party validators. Third-party validators. Uh, uh, and, and that's a national immigration forum there. It's Ali, A-L-I, and Narani is N-O-O-R-A-N-I. You can look them up. Okay. Um, and what was I going to say about that? Um, well, that's one of the reasons why we did the Green Card Stories book, is we wanted to sort of take it from the political level and put it into human interest level. So I think if you hear these individual stories, you sort of realize not all immigrants are bad. And some immigrants, you know, can help us. And so by putting a human face on immigration, we are hoping to change the immigration debate. Well, we've done a great job of that, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had a, I was just curious, like, what jobs aren't Americans filling? Like, we talked about, like, this kind of, ed, like, employment gap, and I was just kind of curious what jobs were we not fulfilling as a country? A uh, farm worker, I think, is the first example right. that comes to mind. Um, a lot of low-skilled immigration, um, you know, construction Hotel. workers, things like that. Hotel. Hotel workers, Hotel. Hotel. Um, you know, maids. Maids. maids, things like that. You know, and you can argue, well, it's because we're not paying them enough. You know, if we paid a farm worker $25 an hour, you know, would you get U.S. workers to do it? Probably Maybe not. for a day. Yeah. <laughs> and then they see how hard it is, and they can say, I don't care how much you pay me, I'm not going to yeah. do that work. And we wouldn't want to pay for the milk. And you wouldn't want to pay yeah. for the milk. So yeah. we're spoiled. We have some right. of the lowest, you know, farm price, agricultural prices in the world because we have low wages. So it's a combination of things. It's not, that's why immigration is so complicated. You can't say, get rid of all the immigrants and all our problems will be solved. You can't say, let them all come in and our problems will be solved. You need to have a balance. And where you find that balance and how you change that balance over time is very difficult. Yes? I wonder, if we have all these undocumented immigrants, how is it we can't figure out a way to charge them for taxes, Social Security, and the services that we give them? Has well, everybody thought about that? Well, actually, in one sense, they already are paying because they want to appear to be legal, so they get Social Security numbers and have wages deducted from their wages. I mean, have Social Security. The undocumented people? Undocumented people. Yeah. And it goes into yeah. the Social Security yes. Trust Fund. It stays there. It stays there, which we U.S. citizens benefit from. If we did not have a Social Security Trust Fund funded primarily by undocumented immigrants, we'd already be bankrupt in Social Security. Um, so in that sense, you know, they already are contributing. In the second sense, if taxes. we did have a legalization, and they pay taxes as well, because they want to you know, be on the right side of the law. They don't want to be prosecuted for not paying taxes. And second, you know, if there were a legalization program, all of the proposals that I've seen would force them to pay a penalty 
or being undocumented. So mm -hmm. the Treasury would get more money that way as well, too. So, yes. Can you name a two or three countries that you think have really good or, or the best the best of the worst, whatever, immigration systems, legislative Canada. implementation? Canada. Who does it well? Canada does it well. Australia is a good system, but they're also somewhat uh, lucky because they've got an ocean all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have people trying to get in. But Canada, you know, again, it's somewhat isolated. People aren't trying to, you know, flee from America, the United States, into Canada. But they have a pretty good immigration system there that's more flexible, can go up and down with the economy. Yes. Can you talk about language? Lots of different phrases for migrant, immigrant, refugees, undocumented. What language do you prefer so it's not so pejorative and overcharacterized? Um, I prefer foreign national or non-citizen. Uh, alien is the technical term if you look in the immigration laws. That's who they refer to. And so if I'm quoting the immigration statute, I have to use that word. But otherwise, I prefer the word foreign national or non-citizen. Um, I try to stay away from refugee or asylum, except in the legal sense, I guess, because I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> any other questions? One last question, then we'll break it up for food. So this wasn't going to be my question, but you mentioned Social Security numbers. Yes. How do they get that? I mean, I... How do they get that? Well, I had to be born, to, and so I, like, you know, I got the one at birth, States. basically. Yeah, right. You can buy... I needed a birth certificate the, from the New Jersey. Jersey. I read a story about a month ago where you go to MacArthur Park, uh, and, people, and you say, I, I want to buy a Social Security card, and for $150, you get one that looks legitimate. Yeah, but it has to be attached to a person. It is. <laughs> it is, oh, but it's on, not, it's not you, but an employer doesn't know that. Or well, they'll have your name on it, Juan Gomez, but the Social Security number will be, you know, actually somebody else's Social Security number. So that lucky U.S. citizen is getting your Social Security, um, you know, deductions going to their account in Social Security. See, that I can see much more likely, but the Social Security Department would know that. They'd say, why are we getting two? They don't necessarily know. You're giving too much credit. I mean, if I was an employer... I would just say, listen, I'm deducting this for Social Security from the, the worker who doesn't know anything right. and just pocket the money. No, because, well, no, because if you have 10 employees, you know, payroll, New York State Labor Department's right. going to know you have 10 employees. So they'll do an audit and find you have 10 employees. And if you're only um, <coughs> deducting money for workers' compensation or Social Security for nine employees, they're going to say, there is a discrepancy here. You're assuming I'm doing this on the books. I don't know why you're assuming that. <laughs> Well, that could be. And that's another problem. If you have a lot of illegal immigrants, you have less compliance with law. And that's a problem that we should be trying to address. So it's another reason to try to resolve this problem. One last, last question. Don't be a very basic question. So someone who is undocumented, working in the United States, and not criminal, can be deported. Yes. And what would that process look like? They would be arrested for... Just because they may be arrested because they go through a stop sign. Oh, okay. um, and the police pick them up and ask for identification, and either they don't have identification or they have false identification. a false identification that the police officer recognizes, so then they call ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They come down to Ithaca, pick them up, put them into an immigration detention facility. The closest one to Ithaca is in Batavia, New York. Uh, there, he has the person has the opportunity to go before one of these immigration judges. Um, and they can either say, I agree, I'm here illegally, I want to leave voluntarily. If that's the case, they're usually out within 30 days and they're back deported um, you know, to Mexico or wherever. But if they have a claim to stay in the United States, maybe they just married a U.S. citizen, maybe they fear persecution, then they'll have a hearing before an immigration judge. <clears throat> and again, as I pointed out with the backlogs, that may take two or three years for them to so have where that are, where, where are they put in detention? They're put in, de in, in, detention. in detention. In detention. And they can't. <laughs> well, well they, can be, they can be released. Uh, they may have to pay a bond. Sometimes they can't afford the bond. The average bond in upstate New York is $7,500, which not all immigrants can afford to pay. Um, and sometimes if they are released, they have ankle monitors put on them, so they have to check in with immigration while they're waiting for their hearing. So again, because... 40, we have 44,000 beds nationally, but that's still not enough to hold everybody. So usually immigration, after a while, will release people who are not criminals, mm -hmm. but will force them to pay this bond so that they do show up for their hearings. But they may have to wait two or three years for their hearing before an immigration judge. The immigration judge will make a ruling as to whether they can stay here or not. 
They can then appeal that up to the federal courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court if they want. Uh, but eventually, if there's a final order of deportation, then they have to leave the United States. So. Well, that cheery note. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>